basically two primary goals that, that we've seen over the years. One is a, a little bit shorter term in, in daily, weekly, monthly operations, and that's to take information being generated by these condition monitoring technologies to try to eliminate failures in service so you don't disrupt production and uh, increase uh, uh, maintenance costs beyond what they could be. A secondary and a longer term goal that, that's a little bit of different, takes a different mindset is being able to analyze a, long, a large period of that information that might be produced so that you can understand where your repetitive failure modes are, your headaches are, and address those so that you can increase operating life uh, between asset failures or out of service issues. And, and that, that really focuses a lot on uh, root cause analysis and how that is treated in, uh, within the organization. Once again, there's a lot of information that, that uh, gets generated during these stages of, uh, of a piece of equipment's life cycle in, in, in any industrial asset, whether we're talking uh, rotating equipment such as pumps, gearboxes, motors, uh, stationary equipment like tanks, pipes, uh, just general structures, uh, electrical equipment like transformers, uh, MCE centers with, with all of their buckets and breakers. Um, and there's a cycle of that information being generated in a lot of, from a lot of different sources from the point that a piece of a, an asset is purchased, either as a, a new capital expansion item or as a repair item or replacement item, to a point where it goes into the equipment inventory, maybe it goes into service quickly, maybe it goes into a storage area and, and goes through a certain set of maintenance steps and care steps at that point. From stores, it ends up going into an installation on some base plate somewhere to provide some uh, service, and I'm really talking about component items, as I said, like motors, pumps, gearboxes, blowers, um, and at some point, there may be a need for repair. And this cycle can end up repeating itself many, many times and generating these types of information. I may be doing periodic testing, such as uh, uh, MCE testing or, or surge testing, on uh, mega testing on motors that are on store shelves. I may be doing uh, turns on those shelves, shelves just to keep uh, uh, false burnelling from happening on the shafts. Once that piece of equipment is in its uh, service location as a motor driving a gearbox, driving a paper machine roll, for example, uh, then I probably have a significant amount of condition monitoring information from things like vibration analysis or oil analysis, uh, perhaps in the, uh, infrared tomography being done on both the electrical side of the system and maybe some mechanical aspects. I may have walk around inspections, uh, just general pieces of information that are being captured. And we're gonna talk about one of the difficulties of why these are, or that comes from them being done by so many different people using so many different pieces of technology, if it's condition monitoring, such as vibration or infrared tomography, or somebody just walking around uh, with clipboards taking notes on, uh, on a, a, a basic operator care for inspection, or maybe a lube route tech doing his routes. Then when you get to repair, again, depending on what level of advancement a particular organization has achieved, you may, uh, have a, cert, a, a set of uh, high, a high set of standards for uh, certain repair procedures on certain types of equipment, such as your AC induction motors versus a DC shunt motor versus a uh, hydraulic cylinder uh, in a metal rolling operation. Uh, but there's lots of information that's getting generated, either whether it's an in-house repair shop or uh, an outside vendor. Uh, you know, from where it's being done, uh, what's being learned during teardown and inspection to the information being turned into a repair quote, progress of that repair as it proceeds through the shop process, uh, and in particular, whether or not some warranty might be generated at the end. And once again, those three steps of, of being in stores, going to installation, and having a repair issue may be repeated in multiple cycles over the usable life cycle of any individual asset. One of the other major areas of information then would be, okay, do I have access to see the big picture of these multiple cycles of failure modes and what the repairs were 
and associate with them with either uh, a particular location or an asset or let's say a motor as it's migrated from one base plate to another to another over its service life all the way up to the point in time that some decision is made that it's no longer an economical uh, practice to continue to operate or repair this piece of equipment and it might be scrapped. So my point is, is there's tremendous amounts of information being generated. The major obstacles are, is that these are coming from very many different sources. Uh, in many, most cases, plants, uh, whether they're doing the condition monitoring work themselves or whether it's being done through service contractors are probably using different uh, brands of technology for vibration versus thermography, which means that each of those has had its own technology database set up to manage the data collection and analysis of that particular technology information. And then when they're done with a scheduled route or any special test, typically, the results may get communicated by email to different people, different groups within the plant, particularly whether it's uh, deemed to be a mechanical type inspection versus a, an electrical. That's one of the biggest things we see is that a lot of times those operate as two very different worlds. Uh, we also see lots of engineers, maintenance engineers, reliability engineers that build their own cubby holes, their own access databases or Excel spreadsheets and they're trying to keep up with a lot of this information. Um, perhaps it's some of the equipment design or calibration information on things like the uh, uh, MCE buckets uh, and, and breakers. Uh, or sometimes they get buried kind of way down inside the CMMS or the EAM if you're using something like SAP or Oracle. Uh, and once again, if it's that information that's coming from the outside, uh, service contractors or repair shops, there's an additional issue that is probably more pertinent than ever of whether or not any IT organization is going to allow those outside personnel to have access through firewalls to any kind of a database or any kind of a system that's uh, proprietary and internal, you know, to the plant or to the business. Um, the only that leaves the only uh, option for all of this information that's being generated, if it's coming to six different people or 20 different people in emails, is the question of does anybody really have time to transfer it from those emails into some common database or some system inside the plant? Or like most of us, does the email list kind of become our document librarian? So what that leads to is the typical state of reliability information management today is that I get all these islands of information, whether it's in, in within a CMMS system or an EAM system, you know, the work order system, whether it's in individual reports that have been emailed out as Word documents or PDF files. Um, and because different people are generating these all the way from the setup of that vibration uh, route collection database or the infrared thermography scans, most of the time those technicians are not using any standardized nomenclature that matches what's in the EAM or the work order system to describe the individual locations. And certainly, since they're standalone islands of information, it's a major effort to try to integrate those directly with each other. And the result is, is that the communication about what each technology is finding, what each reliability engineer knows, what the maintenance organization is doing in terms of prioritizing uh, work, particularly that that probably ought to have a higher priority based on the actual health condition of assets, is poorly communicated and there's little accountability for who's supposed to carry the ball to take care of that. And certainly in the long run, I've heard over and over how difficult it may be to try to pull together uh, the right information uh, over the last 10 years of equipment failures or location issues out of big systems like an SAP or an Oracle. It's not that it can't be done, they just kind of wonder if they're ever going to be able to get it done in their lifetime. So, like I'm saying, a lot of times the question or this, this question of how do I manage all this large volume of information kind of comes back to, well, boy, that's what our CMS, our work order system is supposed to do. 
Unfortunately, those are rarely built with maintenance or the reliability organization in mind. They're controlled by IT. They tend to focus on the bean counting, if you will, to use that term, uh, in terms of tracking manpower, uh, man hours, uh, parts cost, uh, repetitive things like PMs that are time-based uh, maintenance items and, and you know, when's it time, what's the scheduling on those uh, PM work orders. One other primary issue that we see is many, many times uh, these items, these CMMS or EAM systems don't build their location hierarchy down to an asset component level. They stop at a machine train or a system level when in fact, reliability really occurs at knowing what's happened with each component, uh, each repairable asset component, like a motor, like a pump, like a gearbox, like a transformer in the distribution system. And they don't know much about it within those CMMS systems. They're pretty lucky in most cases to have even the nameplate information, much less any additional information such as what are the bearings on the drive in versus the non-drive in of this particular motor that would be very helpful to the technicians that are doing your vibration analysis. And then finally, reports typically are not all that visually oriented. And again, as I said before, it can be, we hear again and again how difficult and time it is to, time intensive it is to, to dig those reliability metrics out of the big systems like an SAP or an Oracle. So with that overview, what we're going to talk about, and this is the first and is an overview pre uh, presentation for a series of 12 of these Tango Talks that are going to focus on what we believe are best practices for managing that large volume of reliability information. And I'll go through the 12 here, but once again, there are going to be separate uh, sessions roughly every two weeks on more details about uh, what each of these best practices really entails. But in order they are, in order to properly manage this high volume of information and have it focus on getting the reliability results of uh, eliminating failures in service and providing the information available for the longer term life cycle analysis to, to eliminate the repetitive failure modes, it's absolutely important to get this information consolidated in a single database. And we'll be talking about a web hosted, or in today's terminology, a cloud database, so that that database is not only accessible by the people inside the plant who might be inputting information and are certainly the dominant users for needing to withdraw or retrieve information um, out of that database, but by being uh, in today's cloud technology, the security levels can be very significant so that it provides that doorway, that, that, that ability to have portals for outside vendors, such as uh, service contractors doing vibration analysis, thermography, uh, oil analysis labs, or repair vendors like motor shops or gearbox repair shops, uh, to be able to input information directly and skip that emailing process uh, that ends up with the info not becoming database and easily searchable and retrievable. One of the first, the, the best practice number two is that I'm not talking about focusing on raw data, the vibration spectra or the infrared thermography images. Those are what the tools that those technicians are using, uh, use to analyze and to turn that from raw data into what we call actionable information. I, I want to know what that technician has decided that information means, uh, somewhat like the, the doctor that I may go to taking an EKG. I don't want him to just hand that EKG to me and tell me to you know, decide what it means because I'm not capable. I don't have the right tools. What I want to know is his anal analyzed result, that actionable information that may come out of that set of data. And I want to have access to the pertinent data that supports that perhaps, but my primary focus is on managing the results that are coming from and the decisionable information that's uh, coming from these different uh, uh, inputs like vibration, infrared tomography, or the repair shops. Best practice number three focuses on making sure you're not just tracking the location. In most CMMS EAM setups that we've seen, 
the dominant focus, the, the easiest information to get to is associated with location, uh, base plate locations, if, if you want to think about it that way. And it's much harder to understand which modem was on serv in service on that uh, uh, condensate return pump two years ago and what its history may have been, what its failure modes may have been versus the motor that's sitting there today or the motor that may be sitting there six months from now. If you have information about, if you will, histories of both the separate location and the individual uh, serial number, tag numbered pieces of equipment, you are in a much better position from a reliability standpoint to understand whether or not the root causes of a problem might be associated with the location itself or whether they're actually being carried from base plate to base plate, location to location, by a bad actor piece of equipment. A, uh, a motor, for example, with an eccentric uh, bearing housing that somehow just hasn't been detected over the last uh, three repairs in five years that it's been going out to a motor repair shop. And somehow, magically, it has a short MTBF even every time it goes to a new location and is put in service. Best practice number four is to focus on centralizing the management. Once again, we're not, you, you're, not worried, you're not trying to take the place of the individual technology systems for vibration or thermography or, or ultrasonics because those specialize in managing that individual technology for the work being done at your site. What you want to do, though, is to have, a, an, from a reliability perspective, the ability to have an overview of all of the tasks, when they're supposed to be done, how often they're supposed to be done, are they being done on time. This is, uh, again, from a management perspective, the ability to understand whether I am getting the coverage that, that has been determined through you know, all the processes that occur, like uh, RCM to determine criticalities and the, the intervals on which vibration analysis or thermography may, be, may need to be uh, uh, done. But it's very hard when these are individual islands of information to know whether everything is being covered on the time frame it should if there's not a centralized management capability. Number five is very associated with that but it's one that, that so often gets overlooked. There's a large number of walk-around inspections, uh, basic operator care inspections, lube technicians running their routes, uh, mechanical inspections or electrical inspections that are being done by those craftsmen. And it's amazing today how many plants still have those being done by paper on a clipboard, only to have the information that's in those sheets once that time has been invested to disappear into a stack on some on a maintenance supervisor's desk, for example, or maybe a reliability engineer's desk, and end up in a steel cabinet somewhere, only to be uh, pulled out uh, when there, there's an insurance audit to see if we're actually doing all of those inspections the way we're supposed to. Uh, it's very important, we think, as a best practice, to make sure that those walk-around inspections are digitized and that once again with current technology and the availability of durable tablets for example i i particularly don't have a finger that's a good size to try to do an uh, input information for an inspection on a smartphone but a medium size a seven inch to a ten inch tablet can do wonders even if you're putting it in something like an outer box case to give it a little more durability for survival you know in a plant environment and once that's digitized then once again, those can now communicate directly with this sing a single cloud database so that all of that information can be just as valuable as the higher technology, higher cost inspections that are being done by things like vibration analysis or infrared thermography. Best practice number six would say to present all of that actionable health information in a single condition status dashboard. And I would add one word to that and make it an interactive. Uh, once again, if you're dealing with a cloud database and web browser access, uh, then there's no reason not to allow that to become literally the uh, discussion forum or thread for everything that's, that's being learned about a problem on a uh, particular asset uh, in the plant and 
keep that up in front of everybody rather than, you know, just uh, being updated through emails, which, uh, again, have a very perishable lifetime as, as, as that email list grows. And the, uh, uh, the email I'm interested in keeping is now two weeks old and 300 uh, emails down. Best practice number seven is to not just to rely on the presence of a tool like a condition status dashboard to get the job done, but to address the human side of this business and to use uh, one, one reliability engineer came up with a term we like called REDS meetings. And that was to use that, that condition status dashboard that was highlighting all of the problems at the top of an interactive discuss discussion thread as the focus of semi-monthly meetings that involved a representative from operations in particular, in particular areas, the maintenance personnel, maintenance planners, and the reliability personnel so that they could specifically discuss those known health problems and determine who was accountable for the next step in follow through. You know, was it ordering parts or are we waiting on shielded bearings? Uh, to come in and or some special item that purchasing says is going to take uh, three months to arrive. Uh, how do we how do we make sure that we don't let the uh, uh, accountability get dropped uh, as this process of addressing these problems uh, stretch out over time? Best practice number eight is to provide the kind of portal so that the results that are being learned by repair vendors. Uh, is part of this reliability database. And in fact, there's probably, if you spent much time in places like motor shops, it's amazing what you might hear from the technicians doing tear down and inspection on those motors and how they might be laughing at, uh, well, here's that same motor that we've seen, you know, every six months or a year and a half. And once again, it's been over greased. You know, we just got uh, wind, uh, windings filled up with grease and overheating and yep, they had a premature failure again. Uh, if you make it easy to capture that, and once again, to allow that vendor to do the work of databasing that information rather than perhaps sending a, even a detailed report via email, then having it in a database absolutely makes the retrievability and the data mining more doable than it would ever be if things get stranded in that email list. Best practice number nine is to have a routine, and we're getting into the area now more of the, uh, certainly of the reliability engineers, of focus on identif identifying bad actor locations versus the bad actor assets. And I described that earlier. You know, is it some problem with this location? Is it in a cooling tower where I have a uh, uh, a lot of water and I'm using motors without uh, uh, seal bearings or, am I, or do I have people doing uh, wash downs in the wrong manner and they need some education? Uh, am I storing um, uh, fluids wrong that are getting added into you know, my oil is it being, or grease? Is it being marked properly and put into the right locations or is that what's causing these repeated failures versus a motor? that might be carrying its problem, you know, from one base plate to another to another over its lifetime. Best practice number 10 is to document and manage the corrective actions coming from root cause cases once I've identified these bad actors and perhaps spent the time, uh, and again, this might be a lot of time or it might be a little time, the, the uh, degree to which a root cause analysis uh, is is taken on can vary tremendously. It can be as simple as the uh, the, the people sitting around con the conference table sharing their tribal knowledge and answering the uh, five whys, you know, just over and over to come up with the root cause. Or it could be a very sophisticated Weibel analysis, you know, with statistical information, uh, a, a very detailed engineering study. But one of the things that happens over and over again is the focus is on the technical aspects of a root cause analysis. And as decisions are made, and those decisions involve different people having responsibility for taking certain corrective actions, whether or not those corrective actions get followed up on just way too often falls between the cracks. You know, they got assigned 
there's no accountability, no means of seeing whether or not those have been followed up uh, six weeks or six months later. Once again, with everything in a single cloud uh, database, it makes it very easy to keep track of who has, who's carrying the ball and when are they supposed to score the touchdown. And then using that in meetings to be able to make sure the end goal is achieved. Best practice number 11 is while you're doing this, it's very important to say, are we actually delivering a business benefit to the company? And once again, it's far too common to see, to see very successful, technically successful reliability program efforts end up with the, the hard question being asked. A new plant manager comes in or a new maintenance supervisor and says, well, why do we need that contractor doing uh, the vibration analysis? We, we're not suffering any uh, unexpected failures in service right now. And without having documented the history of how a change has been driven by those reliability practices and reliability programs, it's very hard to make that justification. And so, so doing that, again, brick by brick, one case at a time, is far more effective than trying to respond to the, to the hard question when it comes and you have to start trying to dig into these multiple sources to, to build a case. And finally, uh, best practice number 12, is to have a, a make, take advantage of this single databasing and have a consistent means of tracking the reliability per performance metrics. Are we covering all of the assets that we expected to on schedule or are we lagging? What's the reason? Did we set our goals too high for inspecting too often? Um, have we had a manpower uh, reduction that, that's making that, that achievable goal from two years ago non-achievable now? Do I really need to be covering things on a monthly basis with vibration analysis? Uh, can I look at my MTBFs and my history of failure modes by, by equipment types and uh, locations and understand maybe I'd be, I'll be well covered if I go to uh, 90 days rather than monthly? Tracking those performance metrics are very important. So having covered all 12, I'll show you some examples. That, that's our goal. Again, the, and I will say the business that 24-7 is in is providing this kind of a cloud database that will allow an organization to uh, efficiently, and not, not overnight, I would never tell anybody this is something that happens just because you have the right tool, but it, it can become the backbone of a process for achieving these 12 best practices. So to show you that, we'll first start off with a, um, again, location structure. We wanna talk about having things in a single database. In this case, this one happens to be a, a sewer district in Cincinnati. Uh, as a governmental, uh, as a municipal organization, they have given us permission to show their database, or a live database that they're working in every day. Uh, and, uh, you know, give it that transparency for their uh, operations. And they have seven different uh, treatment plants, and they break these down all the way to the individual component locations. So here I've got a, the, the electrical component, you know, that's powering or that's energizing this aeration blower number one. I've got the motor, and it's directly uh, driving this blower. Uh, I go down to the digestion blowers, got the same kind of thing. If I want to see, and these are the locations, and I see these in this case, you'll see I'm going by uh, functional areas all the way down to the individual component, but these tell me that I don't know anything. They haven't entered information here about what piece of equipment is uh, in this particular AC motor location, for example. It does have, uh, they are happen to be using Maximo, as their EAM work order system. So it gives a reference so that these can be linked to their Maximo system uh, as work orders are needed. Um, but, but again, I don't know anything about what horsepower, you know, uh, et cetera, this motor is. If I want to see that information for what they have, I can do searches here and I'll find one. 
Uh, see here, for example, this is an installed uh, pump location. So if I locate it in the tree, then I'll see that this is part of the uh, Mill Creek plant in the influent, influent pump area. It's on a uh, seal water pump number two. Uh, in this case, it had a vibration problem that was closed. Uh, it had a, and that was in December of 18 and January of 18. It also had a, a vibration issue. And I can see the entire history, uh, you know, for that piece of equipment. Um, Okay. Now that really is what they're tracking both the individual piece of equipment information and I'm going to once I do that I'll sh I'm going to skip to this database very quickly when I when I see what what that motor detail is I can segregate what's going on in the location by looking up a location history or I can look up the equipment history and this is where I start including the information that can be drawn in from all of the various repair shops with them entering the data through a cloud database portal. So I see that this particular motor, by the way, this one is a 509 UPD uh, frame size, a 350 horsepower, 460 volt. Uh, it's designed for working in this Colwell uh, pump location. And it's been installed, and this is actual data from a metals operation, an aluminum uh, smelting operation that uh, uh, the, the engineer was keeping his own uh, database back in the, up until the late 1990s when he realized it wasn't going to go past Y2K, and he uh, imported all of his info into uh, our system at that point. Like this particular motor had been installed several different times, uh, six or seven different times, and had very short mean time between failure modes, you know, a few days, half a year, two, two and a half years, a month, less than a year, and then finally started to get better in MTBF. And by, by being able to track that equipment history, that individual asset as it moved around, he could see that uh, the, the red bar rows are repair histories and back then they weren't tracking much in terms of uh, details about the repair other than who repaired it and what the cost was. But he could see that this particular tag numbered motor, which is 14, 1452, actually moved from this location, which was motor number six in the cold well in January of 84, had a short uh, service life and needed repair. And then it went to motor number five base plate, and it lasted uh, five months or three months, I'm sorry, at that point, and needed, no, five months, and needed repair again. And in this case, went to the same place and spent another $2,200. So they were keeping track and they get smarter about the information they were capturing from the repair shops and started getting the repair shops to capture that information they were finding at uh, teardown and inspection, for example, on what they found in terms of winding. In this case, it was a lubricant contains water that uh, the repair shop suggested was a root cause and leading to the grounding problems and the drive end bearing failure. Uh, and they were capturing more information in terms of not only cost, but also some linked document information in the single database so that all that was at their fingertips, including uh, the ability to, you know, for the reliability engineers to start to see this repetitive failure mode. And long story short, this is one of those things that has happened way too often. This was, a, as I said, a uh, uh, coal well pump location. And in fact, they were having every, the majority of these were related to water and lubricant uh, and water intrusion. And for 15 years, they had spent re uh, just repetitive failure after repetitive failure, spending several thousand dollars per repair uh, before it was determined to either do something about uh, changing the uh, sheltering in the location from water or uh, putting in in pro seals in the um, um, motor itself as a part of the repair. 
So, all right, one other thing I'll talk about the uh, managing the walk around inspections, uh, you know, as a best practice. So, I'll go back to this uh, municipal sewer database. It allows them having it in one database. Now, again, the, the work is actually still being done in the individual technology databases. Uh, the technician, in this case, they're all in house at the sewer district that are doing uh, tomography, vibration, and ultrasonics. But from one control panel, management and the reliability engineers can see what's coming up and what's due and what's overdue in terms of all of the tasks. And so here we see that uh, uh, Mr. Leverage started a task uh, three days ago. So far, he hasn't assessed any of the 21 items, uh, and it's an ultrasonic testing um, task. Whereas there's an electrical online task uh, that Mr. Hood started way back in March, and he has accomplished two out of six, but it's now overdue. So I need to probably follow up with Mr. Hood uh, and Mr. Little on his vibration route and understand uh, why we haven't, uh, you know, gotten all of these assets uh, covered as needed. Um, once these are uh, completed, now we move to that, so see that was best practice number six, where we talked about needing to have all the information in a, uh, an integrated dashboard. And that's what this would look like and is, is being used by this sewer district is, looking at the whole plant, the ability to see that currently, I have a high severity issue on a centrifugal pump on raw sewage pump number two coming from route vibration and that I, it's been out there for not quite half a year at this point. We do have two work orders open on this. Uh, I don't have any status comments that could have been put in in terms of uh, why this thing's still out there at 141 days. The other ones that are at the top of the list on this uh, pump number three from uh, report coming from ultrasonics tells me it's fairly new. It's been out there less than a month. And once again, we already have follow through with work order being generated. Although again, and, and I have the codes that tell me uh, that it's already in plan is, and the work is scheduled. So that gives me a quick overview of where that one stands. And here's one that gives me information coming from both technologies, two technologies, tomography and ultrasonics, on a motor that uh, has a particular problem. And we'll just take a look at the details with one click. Uh, looks like they've got a, a clogged uh, cooling fan on the end of the DC motor. That came from the tomography, finding uh, too much of a delta T in heat. And the ultrasonic technician believes he's found a grease problem, uh, you know, coming from lubrication. So uh, that gives the work planners and the, the people involved in that uh, best practice number seven a re at a REDS meeting the details they need to discuss, you know, when are these two work orders actually going to be get closed. And in that case, we would use a technology called checkoff, which can be automated, by the way. Uh, uh, you can create links with the web hosted database, the cloud database, and the work order system so that when a work order closes, it can do automatically do the checkoff uh, on each of the uh, open work orders. And at that point, checkoff would then set a button in this case closure uh, column that would help. Uh, basically, it's a two step validation process. It says we know work has been completed but we don't want to remove this problem from the dashboard until the, in this case, the vibration, the ultrasonic testing or the tomography technicians have gone out, re-inspected, and found that there's no problem uh, uh, with the piece of equipment. At that point, it would be closed, and that particular issue on the uh, uh, motor would become part of the history of this particular location and individual piece of equipment and it would be removed from the uh, top of the list. Now I mentioned repair vendors, the how that repair information gets in is there's a portal that is very specifically available for the repair vendors so that once again, they are not 
having to send emails and hope that someone's going to be able to populate the reliability database with that repair findings uh, and detailed information, but they can actually document that uh, as they go through the process. So in this particular one, um, I see that uh, there were bearings damaged. It hasn't been finished yet. Um, they're being asked to send a detailed quote after teardown and inspection. They did have some uh, several photographs here. I won't go through all of them about the, the uh, damaged motor uh, before it went to teardown and um, uh, inspection. Uh, but this will allow the shop to document this repair all the way through, including the details of what faults they actually find and what repair processes they use. And if you have, if you are using a a, uh, a template document that, that you want populated to to uh, achieve some standard that you've set for your repair processes, then those could be linked as well as part of the documentation to this particular repair case. And it is managed as a the doc in the document library uh, against that individual uh, piece of equipment, in this case a motor, wherever that motor goes on return to the plant and in its future uh, service. Okay, uh, to, to define to find bad actual locations, and again, I'm starting to run a little long on time, so I'm gonna, because uh, I wanna leave some time for question and answer. By having this information available, uh, you can do a lot of things, like in this case, a condition entry analysis. You can look at fault distribution, because you've accumulated all this information in one central database through the cloud, allowing access by both internal plant sources and your outside vendors. Oops. That's all the raw data. I want to go down and produce some graphs here real quick. And this is where I start to practice uh, best practice number nine, where I'm, I'm getting using my historical information to spot my bad actors, whether it's an individual location or pieces of equipment. So I'm looking here to see that my primary, as a matter of fact, my first three primary failure modes are lubrication uh, oriented. So I have some repetitive uh, problems from a lubrication standpoint, and I, maybe I need to make that a, a major effort in planning my reliability budget for the coming year. Uh, I also get to start to see what kinds of equipment. In this case, it's a generic mechanical type in the sewer operations that is the most uh, often reported from a condition monitoring standpoint. Not surprisingly, motors are high in the list as well as pumps, and then it goes down from there. Um, and once again, I can look at all the individual cases and then go back to the location and look at all the details just to, to start to do my bad actor analysis. One other thing that is, um, we mentioned the best practices is I have identified those bad actors and I've decided on spending some level of effort for root cause analysis is the ability to track the corrective actions. And again, because I have information or, or the definitions of all of my uh, asset locations and perhaps the individual assets that are in those locations, I can start to track the individual cases of my root cause dashboard and see what the uh, corrective actions are that have been assigned and whether or not they have been completed. So this is a, a historical database we have. They have a detailed problem of the description. This is in a paper plant, so it's a uh, uh, coupling failure in the first dryer section. And they have uh, provided, uh, and these say that they have completed the actions uh, that were assigned to Mr. Bryan, Mr. Pierce. Mr. Pierce had two of them. Uh, they haven't closed the case, so they could add further corrective actions if necessary. And they actually have a uh, complete 
report that they put on file for this particular one, which hasn't been uh, closed yet, even though it was from back in 2013. This is a previous uh, customer that we dealt with. Uh, but I have that ability to track and see whether or not the corrective actions that were assigned were taken care of on the appropriate due date and checked off. Okay. So finally, I'm going to get to metrics. And that, there were two areas. You, you're, you're documenting your cost avoidance. That's available from the integrated condition status dashboard where you can follow it one case at a time and uh, gain, uh, document the information about uh, potential production loss that was avoided, uh, parts and repair costs that might have been avoided, and even things like transportation costs uh, can, can be documented. But one of the biggest issues is how you keep the status of your reliability effort up in front of the uh, management, who, once again, is not, in many cases, doesn't want to be too bothered with detail. So I may want to uh, be able to generate very quickly an asset uh, health report. I'm going to look at this by just the units. I'm back to the sewer district in Cincinnati. So when I look at it at the individual sewer plant level, I can see here that, for example, I've got several technologies being empl uh, employed, vibration, route vibration, oil lab analysis, offline electrical testing, ultrasonics, tomography, walk around visual inspections, uh, some special vibration testing, online electrical, and electrical infrared. And in fact, at the Indian Creek plant, most of the technologies are fairly current. These dates in the, uh, show me the last time when an inspection was done, and green means that they were measured with no reported problems, whereas the Little Miami plant, uh, or actually Mill Creek even has more, these are fairly current, very current uh, inspections, but I have several technologies that are reporting problems. So if I want to go back and look just at Mill Creek, I can come over to Mill Creek, and I can start to dig in and look at the individual asset components and find out which asset components are causing my problems. So. Here I get everything that's in that particular plant down to the asset component level and a breakdown of which ones are contributing to these red reports uh, that I'm seeing in the plant level. Um, okay. I also have, as you'll see here, lots of other, again, reports that you can uh, mine this uh, uh, cloud database to get once you have the history and, uh, for both your locations and your equipment, and I can find out which locations haven't been measured in a particular point in time. Uh, I can look at risk factor reporting, and these are not all of the reports that are available. They, they can be generated uh, 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 by the individual database, so, but based on what your needs are. Uh, but for example, one of the particular ones might be condition assessment task metrics. I might want to um, see whether or not I'm actually getting coverage on the schedules that I desired. So for this uh, sewer district, uh, for the tech, not for uh, these individual tasks, I can see how many times I had assignments, what the total number of items were, uh, how many were assessed as not measured, which is even though I may have completed a task, I need to really understand whether or not I wasn't able to measure it, measure it because the piece of, in this case, tomography, a lot of times in electrical systems, if it's not running at load, uh, running an electrical or a tomography uh, scan on it really won't tell me anything until it gets to a, a, a high degree or a percentage of load status. But it gives me a route adherence number so I can start to manage which routes I might need to look at in terms and which technologies uh, I might need to look at in terms of low route adherence versus high route adherence. Okay. Now, again, that's the whole focus of this particular presentation has been looking at these 12 best practices, and I just wanted to give you a, uh, a high-level view of how they how they actually look and and can be put to work. Uh, 
in today's uh, world of cloud-based and smart device technology. If you have other questions or want to join us in these future uh, detailed discussions on each best practice, that uh, we'll talk to you then. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.